Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you all very much for coming. I want to kick off. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about microservices, specifically two characteristics of microservices that Martin Fowler and myself wrote about a uh, year and a, or two years or so ago now. Um, I'll come on to that in a second. The way I'm going to talk about these characteristics is through a few stories, so stories about companies I've worked with, uh, been involved with for some years, uh, companies that my colleagues at ThoughtWorks have been involved with. So um, I quite like stories. I quite like stories as a way of conveying um, information. My former colleague, Simon Stewart, who's now at Facebook, is incidentally the author of Buck, which is a build tool. He always used to describe that it was a nice thing on a team to have a team shaman. So this idea that you'd have someone on the team who could tell you the story of how things got the way they are. Uh, so you know, you, you look at this awful Maven pom file and you think, oh, what, what on earth? How could it possibly get to look like this? And so, so you know, the team shaman gathers you all around and says, "I'll tell you the story of the build." You know, so specifically with Maven, that is. <laughs> um, so stories are important. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell some stories today. Um, one of the stories I'm going to um, start with, actually, was something that happened last night. So this isn't specifically about microservices, but I thought it was... I had a very strange experience last night, and I, I just checked the pronunciation. Um, but I believe this is, this is the city where uh, Kierkegaard... Good, is that right? OK, lived. And I had my very own existential crisis last night. I don't know if people were at the conference party. Um, I didn't record anything, and I didn't use a flash, so I think I'm still within... Uh, within the, the, the terms and conditions of being there. But this happened, right? So, and I was, as I was watching this amazing Mindstorms kind of tournament going on in front of me, I found myself sort of floating above my body, looking, looking at this amazing circus with all these candles in the, you know, and these robots fighting in the middle. And I realized suddenly this crisis that we live in the future, right? This is crazy. We went to a circus last night and watched robots fight. <laughs> Honestly. And... And the future's owned by 10-year-olds, right? <laughs> now, this is... This was enough to trigger a crisis in me. Um, and I thought it fitting to share, being, as, as I say, this is the home of existentialism. Um, so, from that story to another story, which goes back, I guess, some decades now. Um, so, Melvin Conway, back in 1968, he postulated Conway's law. He, he postulated this, right? Organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structure of those systems. So the software you build looks like the organization that built it. If you have a UI team, a middleware team, and a, a database team, guess what? You end up with UI, middleware, and a database. Um, I think Dan North was paraphrasing someone else when he said, um, you can also look at it. If you ask seven people to write a compiler, you'll end up with a, uh, a seven-pass compiler. The same thing, right? Now, I was thinking about Melvin Conway, and I was thinking, and it's also worth, incidentally, seeing as we are at GoTo and the, the amount of amazing people you bump into here, I'm just going to check. Um, is Melvin Conway actually in the room? No. I might get into trouble, because this is what I think Melvin Conway looks like. I've no idea if he does or not, but I've got this impression that he's sitting on the balcony watching us all perform writing code, right? He's watching organizations produce software, and he's just there laughing <laughs> and pointing at us. He's commentating all the time on the code we write, because back in 1968, he, he postulated this theory Conway's, that became known as Conway's Law, and it was completely rubbish by everyone. It wasn't until uh, a follow-up paper in the Harvard Business Review, I think it was 2007 with some follow-on work that was published jointly by HBR and MIT, which was called something along the lines of a very long title, A Test of the Mirroring Hypothesis. And this research that they did sort of um, I say proved his hypothesis, didn't disprove his null hypothesis then, I guess. And what they found in this, I've just pulled out uh, some explicit bits from this, what they found was, and they spent time with lots of different organizations, lots of different types of organization, building lots of different types of software, including open source software, so very, very distributed teams. 
And what they found was tightly coupled organizations, even if not an explicit managerial choice, design becomes tightly coupled. So if you've got tightly coupled uh, organizations, you get tightly coupled designs. And on the converse to that, if you have a loosely coupled organization, then what tends to happen is you get uh, more modular architectures, more modular systems that are built by loosely coupled organizations. And so this has been, well, was postulated in 68, um, validated again in 2007, and I still think that we haven't learned the lessons um, from, from, from Mr. Conway, who's still sitting up there laughing at us on the balcony. So just to reiterate, tightly coupled organizations, design becomes tightly coupled, loosely coupled organizations, more modular design. Um, I mentioned I was going to talk about a couple of characteristics. I should probably introduce myself first. My name is James Lewis. Uh, I work for ThoughtWorks, have done for about 10 years. I sort of describe myself as a coding architect, printable engineer type, although these days I do tend to do a lot more sort of um, board level advisory stuff. But in this article, in this paper we wrote, uh, we, we laid out oh, about 10 or so characteristics, one of which is componentization componentization via services, which is what most, I think most people would kind of understand about what microservices are. Microservices is breaking things down into smaller units uh, and deploying them independently and so on, testing them. But we called out, a, a, as I say, many other characteristics, and the two I'm going to focus on today is this idea of organization around uh, banded contexts or, or around business capabilities, um, and this idea of running or of, of building products and actually services, I'll come to that in a sec, rather than projects. So not using projects and building around business capabilities. That's what this, uh, well, however long we've got left, uh, 40 or so minutes is going to be about. I suggest if you're not interested in that, then, uh, but you've read the description. This is pretty much what was in the description. First, I'm going to answer a question that always comes up. So this is the first thing. And the first question is always, how big is a microservice? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there's a very simple answer to this. If you know what, how big a normal sort of service is, and a normal service-oriented architecture is about this big, and a microservice is this big. That's how big microservices are. Small. Smaller than big services, and you can get more of them for your money, apparently, or something. And that's the end of the talk, so thank you very much for coming, and uh, we hope you enjoyed <laughs> microservices and Conway's Law Talk. Seriously, right? I mean, uh, seriously, these are the things, these are the pro some of the properties we want when we're building, when we're decomposing systems into microservices. We want to be, uh, want to be able to replace them cheaply and easily, somewhere between a day and maybe two weeks, that sort of size. We want to be able to scale them for various reasons, throughput, avail um, throughput availability, or even for uh, team size. We want to be able to scale people, avoiding or sort of sidestepping the mythical man month thing. Um, and we want to build them to withstand failure. There's been a lot of talk about um, resilience today, um, which, which is awesome, because th this is part of the whole point of what's making teams building systems out of microservices successful. They're building for resilience. They're building resilience in at the start. And to quote um, Adrian Coe, Adrian Cockcroft, uh, we, we should be able to go with microservices as fast as we possibly can. Right. This is the aim. We want to be able to deliver value to our customers, to um, whether you know whether that's uh, in whether that's to make money or whether that's to save lives or whatever it is we're doing. We want to be able to get features out in front of the people using software, using our systems as fast as possible, so that we can learn and change and and do it all again. This is what we sh should get from microservices. Now, unfortunately, many of us will recognize, I suspect, this, right, the 20th century organization, which kind of looks still in the 21st century like this. So how many people would recognize this kind of siloed, uh, siloed organization? Have a show of hands if you sort of either work or recognize that. Yeah. So, you know, we have development and testing and architecture and ops. All, all these things are separate. Sales, marketing, et cetera, they're all separated out. And often, and I, I'm quite lucky as a consultant, I get to see lots and lots of different organizations. So I get to see lots of ways in which they're broken. Incidentally, there's about 20, and most organizations have between five and 10 different ways of being broken, but most don't have all of them, apart from some, but anyway. Um, 
this is a real diagram from a process flow for development process in this sort of organization. I've obviously redacted names. But this is the sort of thing you sort of tend to see. We've got you know, the different uh, stakeholders down one side, business requirements, documents, business cases, functional specs. OK, we've got detailed estimates. Oh, there's high-level estimates. There's checkpoints. And over here, this is cool, where the ones and zero, this is where coding happens, right? <laughs> And uh, this, I mean, this is not something that, that is uncommon. This is not something that's uncommon still. Um, but I still think this is, this is the, the wrong, the old way of building software. And it's, it's a bit like this idea of snakes and ladders, right? Because what, what ends, ends up happening is you get, you get you know, maybe, maybe sales give the architect some, um, some requirements. They do a high-level plan, high-level design, hand it over to development. Development go, this will never work, hand it back to the architects. The architects say, well, yes, it should do, hand it back, and it, you get this kind of high transaction cost as work is passed around between different silos. I'm contractually obliged at this point to mention this book by two of my colleagues, or well, uh, three of my colleagues, sorry, Joanne, um, Jez, and Barry, Lean Enterprise, which is all about this, all about how you optimize your organization at scale um, in order to go as fast as possible to, to try and address this, these sort of snakes and ladders pro problems. And I'm going to take a slight diversion because one of the things I'm interested in, I think every software developer does it over time, they get into visualization. It's like, yeah, visualization. I can visualize everything, visualize all the things. And so recently, I was using a nice tool called JDEPS to look at dependencies in applications, right? So this is, this is Spring plotted, the dependencies in the Spring libraries plotted on a, well, this is called hierarchical edge bundled algorithm of a chord diagram or something along those lines. It's kind of interesting, and you can see efferent and afferent coupling and all these kind of nice things. And I was thinking, can you do that, though, for the way work works in organizations? Can you use similar sorts of visualization techniques, to, and I think this was talked about yesterday, um, to understand how work flows through organizations? So from concept to cash, if you like that phrase, my old former MD used to say, from soup to nuts, from the start of the meal to the end. And I think you can, right? So you can plot the pathways, you can plot the way work works in organizations using these sorts of visualizations called diagrams. So, for example, this is, this is essentially the snakes and ladders diagram, but plotted uh, as a chord diagram. And where the chords represent handoffs, handovers between departments. And in fact, more explicitly, each of those chords on that diagram, rather than representing in software a dependency, they represent delay in the system. They represent a transaction cost that you're having to pay. And th the interesting thing with this is, if we look at how we're building software these days, a lot of this has been about reducing these calls, removing these out from, from uh, reducing the delays, reducing the transaction costs. But we're not there yet. And this is what the rest of the talk is about. Peter Drucker said, this is a great quote, there is nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. all right. A lot of these handovers are meaningless, pointless, completely pointless. Um, I'm sure people, uh, I'm going to be mean and pick on private clouds as an example. So this seems to be the thing du jour. You know, this, this is the, the, the project du jour of most CTOs. We need a private cloud. We don't trust Amazon. We don't trust uh, any of the other providers. We, we need our own private cloud. And so they, they, they go off and build private cloud, and it's fantastic. And coincidentally, when you ask for a virtual machine on the private cloud, you have to fill in a ticket. And the ticket waits in a queue for days or sometimes weeks, or even in one place I was at, months. And then three months later, you get a virtual machine in your private cloud. Now, th that for me is not addressing the root causes or, or some of the causes of some of these delays because you're still having to pay this transaction cost. Right? So, for example, with private clouds, what we've been saying a lot is everything has to be self-service. Reduce the transaction cost. I'll come back to that in a bit. So I did say I'd talk about uh, business capabilities. What's that got to do with these, these handoffs and things? Well, this is a, a mechanism, I think, of, of organizing the way we work in a way that minimizes these, these delays, minimizes these handoffs, as well as using Conway's law to reinforce the, de the design of the software that we're building, to reinforce the boundaries, to try and ensure that uh, the systems that we're building are decoupled and cohesive. This is the definition. A capability is a combination of people, processes, systems that provide value to customers, internal or external. I'll give you an example. And this is a, an example from somewhere I was working. Um, so there was two, two big teams, one in, uh, one in North America, one in um, Brazil. 
and they, they were building a big, big software system. It was a retail site uh, that sold transportation stuff. So you think of it like bus tickets or train tickets or airline tickets. And on, on one side of this sort of divide, continental divide, uh, you had a team, big team that was building out the retail capability, so the ability to sell, sell inventory uh, to, to, their, to their customers, to the consumers. And in Brazil, they had another capability, which was kind of you know, looking after everything to do with a customer. And this was great. And incidentally, in between these, they had this really nice asynchronous uh, mechanism for communicating. So everything was done with messaging between these two capabilities. When something was sold, a message was put onto a bus somewhere, onto a, onto a, onto a bus, and the other capability could pick this up. That's great. If you don't know what messaging looks like, this is my attempt to demonstrate uh, like that. Awesome. All right. And this is great because this, you know, talking about Conway's law, this is Conway's law in effect. They were separated by a long distance, and actually, Conway's law acted to uh, to make the boundaries between these capabilities actually more more concrete, less porous. And this is all about information theory. It's all about how information flows between people, between teams within organisations. Because there's a long distance, the bandwidth is is you know, there's there's very low bandwidth for communication between these teams even with tools that we have now. So this is good. This is kind of Conway's law acting in our favor in this, in this example for this company. But then when we sort of peeled back the covers and looked inside these business, these capabilities, retail and customers, we found some interesting things going on. And I, I suspect this is happening in a lot of organizations that dive into, hey, microservices, let's go. Microservice ready, TM, etc. And it's this, it's the trouble with projects. Because these capabilities on both sides of this continental divide were built by pretty large teams. You know, there was maybe 60 in one place and you know, 100 in another place. So quite big teams separated by this, by this bus. But they were being these, the teams were using project thinking rather than product thinking or service thinking to build, these, to build their capabilities. I'll give you an example of that. Um, one of my favorite questions when we go into organizations is we ask, so how do you change a single form field on your website, say if it's a web, web shop? And if, if the answer starts with, first we've got to form a project team, so that means we have to talk to the project management office because it's going to take longer than six months. That's project thinking, right? This is, you know, often it's due to um, other reasons, but things like, oh God, if you ask, uh, uh, how, how long does it take you to change? What do you need to do to change a single form field? Well, they say, well, first of all, we'll need to you know, make the change in the HTML, need to make the change in the JavaScript, we need to make the change in our views, and then the controllers on the, you know, the server-side piece of the web app, and then we'll need to, oh, well, then we go off, off to some data services, so we need to change the, the, met, the wife protocol to go off to the data services, and then the data services, they have to change their D, uh, DAOs, D, DTOs, and so on. And then we'll have to go into the database. We'll need to add a new field into the database, into a uh, column, into a uh, database table. Uh, and it just keeps going on and on and on. Right? And this is this idea of uh, project thinking, short-lived teams that come together to deliver one particular small slice of functionality, then disband, throwing the work they've done over the fence. And it's, it's interesting, because what, what, the effect over time of lots of these projects being run against code bases is pretty pernicious. And what we found in this particular example um, is, in fact, whilst the different continental, the different continents were decoupled, inside these capabilities was this tangled, awful mess of quote microservices. Right, they're all quite small, you know, all quite small micro, yeah, not this big. They were this big, which is great. But they were this tangled mess, completely coupled together. You couldn't change one without changing another. And this is not what we're after when we're trying to build this sort of distributed system. Anyone seen this kind of idea come across these sort of hardening periods? Oh, you know, this is so complicated, we have to harden for six weeks before we push out into production. This is a pretty common thing you see when you've got these really tightly coupled sort of microservices. Similarly, you get this idea of having to fan in because we have to test everything against everything else. We're not sure whether making a change in one place is going to have a ripple effect out into the rest of our software. This kind of idea of fanning, fanning in for integration and end-to-end -end testing. And similarly, this other problem we run into quite a lot, which is lockstep deployment. I mean, lockstep deployment can get you quite a long way, but when you have a 1,000 services, 
having to deploy everything at once uh, is not only risky, complicated, but costs you money simply, right? Because um, what you tend to have is features that are, that are building up uh, in, in, uh, as inventory before you're able to deploy them. And every time you get features building up as inventory, you're paying the cost of delay for those features. So if a feature takes, you know, could be in production in three weeks, but it takes six, and it could have earned 10,000 pounds a week, then you've lost potentially 30,000 pounds. I've no idea what that is in crowns, sorry. <laughs> and again, this is this, uh, I, I've got this idea that there's this, there's this old dude, you know, back from back in 68, who's sitting on the side, sitting on the balcony of the theatre, watching us all going, <laughs> This is, this is Conway's law in action again, because you don't have these stable team boundaries, you don't have st stability within uh, these, these giant capabilities. And this is what we've sort of taken to call uh, distributed monoliths, so beware them. Because when you get into this sort of position, this isn't going as fast as possible, this is how to have a nervous breakdown, simply. Now, that's all very well, uh, and I could stop there, and it would be all all be very depressing, um, but maybe I should give you some ideas about um, maybe better ways of organizing our teams so that we can avoid some of this stuff. So what might good look like? And I'm going to talk about this obliquely by talking about Ebola. It, I know, it, it's funny, it, it shouldn't raise a laugh. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But it, but it does. Um, and th this is actually coming back to, I think, one of the themes I've sort of seen in some of the talks I've been at over this conference is looking outside of, en of software engineering for, for how other people are doing things, how other disciplines are, are working. And in this case, it was a, it's, it's because I saw a, a story in the newspaper back in the UK about, about this lady. Um, it's early this year. Her name's uh, Pauline Kafferke. And she was volunteering at a Save the Children hospital in Sierra Leone when, unfortunately, she contracted Ebola. This is at the height of the, uh, of the epidemic. And she was evacuated uh, back to the UK, uh, eventually ended up in a hospital called the Royal Free in London, which is the specialist centre for infectious diseases in London. This is the team. This was in the, this was in the newspaper. And I, I, it's got me thinking, right? So, Given that they're in this circumstance where they've got this oh, you know, desperately unwell woman to treat, and given that, you know, in order to do that, they're going to have to be able to um, you know, execute, they're going to have to be able to make decisions fast about drug regimes, about fluid, about all these different things, and afterwards about how, how, how to re rehabilitate her, because of course, um, as a disease, Ebola is, you know, it, it, it practically wipes out um, where it, well, you are wiped out afterwards, so you need a long, long period of re rehabilitation. So I was thinking, how, how do they organise? And, and hospitals, turns out, in general, you'd think would look a bit like this, right? So lots of different capabilities, all interacting in particular ways, transaction costs between them, and so on. And you can plot this in a chord diagram, and it looks very similar to the way we might organise, um, you know, a typical kind of, uh, I guess, functionally siloed or role siloed uh, organisation. But then I was thinking maybe that's not the case in this. I read on in the article, and it reminded me of this this uh, particular uh, diagram I'd seen. I think Mike Nygaard showed this a while back, and this is a diagram depicting something called the OODA loop. Um, so this is from a guy called Colonel John Boyd, who was a he was a well he was a colonel in the U.S. military, and he was responsible for almost single-handedly changing the doctrine that the Global North used to wage war, pretty much, because um, he noticed when he was training fighter pilots that if you have this this loop, observe, orient, decide, act, and you can execute that loop faster than uh, your uh, enemy in 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 the case of a fighter pilot, then you will be successful. This is this is how how you win dogfights: is you execute this particular loop as fast as you can. And when I say he changed military doctrine, he really did. This approach favours agility over raw power. When he came up with this, and this became popular, popularised within, within the US military, it led to planes being different, so very like light, agile fighters rather than big twin-engine fighters. It led to things like reinforced battle groups, or I think Eric was talking about this yesterday when he was talking about the Marine Expeditionary Force. This is all down to the change of thinking that came from John Boyd and this ability to execute this loop quickly, as fast as possible. 
So as I say, this sort of came to mind when I was reading this article. Maybe this is what these medics are doing. They need to be in a position where they can execute this loop quickly in order to make, this, make the right decisions, um, but without paying these transaction costs of going across to all these different departmental boundaries. This is, I don't expect you to read this, but this is a list of all the people involved in treating Pauline Kafaki. And in, in, well, essentially a third of them, the ones in bold, are clinicians. So they're, you know, they're consultants, uh, infectious disease nurses, uh, specialist registrars, etc., etc. But two thirds of them aren't. Two thirds of them are people like pharmacists, people like porters, domestic services support workers, security people, etc., etc. So two thirds of the people involved in treating her weren't actually directly clinicians. This was the supporting network that they brought in from around the hospital, the different capabilities. And it's interesting, this is a quote from the guy, who, uh, Mike, uh, Dr. Michael Jacobs, who led, led her treatment. <coughs> if you imagine all the functions a hospital has to have, they all have to be involved. And they all have to be specially trained, etc., to work in this environment. But all the functions the hospital had were all put together in one place to ensure the best outcome for that particular patient. There were two others, <coughs> uh, sorry, Brits, who were <coughs> frog in my throat, who were infected. They were both treated at the same place, and they had a 100% survival rate, which is which is pretty amazing. And this is how they do it: they get everyone together into one place. So rather than be organised like this they kind of bring everyone together, right? They minimize these, these handoffs, these transaction costs. And essentially, this is about you know, creating a cross-functional team that has one single purpose. And in their case, it was successful treatment of, of the patient. Um, in our case, it would be, I guess, you know, f we're focused on the customer outcome, on successfully delivering features. And this is this, is this thing, this idea of minimizing handoffs between teams. And we've, we've got some data from a project in Australia that's been running a fairly long time. Um, it's from a big telecom, uh, uh, telco in Australia. And they found um, over, over a period that, it, so this is about story cards, so features if you like. Cards that stayed within the team were, an, uh, were finished an order of magnitude more quickly than cards that had to leave the team for a reason. Right? This is an order of magnitude difference in how uh, fast you can go, how much, how much throughput you can get. That's quite a lot, right? That's, that's a big deal. And as we've sort of pointed out, and others have, this is true for the trauma teams in hospitals. My sister's a uh, uh, you know emergency room nurse. This is exactly what happens when a critical patient comes in. They swarm. They get all the specialities there, ready, waiting, so they can provide the best possible care. Same on Formula One teams. It's not just the drivers who are there testing the car. It's everyone. It's all the engineers. And it's the same for this idea of the reinforced battle group. So, great, fine, all very well. Uh, hospitals do things in a particular way. Um, what does that mean for us as engineers and people working in big organizations? So, this is another example, another story from a place I worked, where they originally started off exactly similar to uh, you know, this sort of uh, siloed by role, um, sort of, sort of prototypical 20th century company. But they, uh, over a period of time, they, they created cross-functional teams and they decided um, that they were going to also split up the, the application they were, going to work, they were working on into separate lines of business. So as an example of that, this is this insurance company. Uh, they had this big monolith with everything happening in one place, all the different products they sold, insurance, it was home, motor, pet. Apparently you get pet insurance, I didn't know that. Life insurance, etc big database, and they decided over time they were going to split this up, so they extracted uh, each uh, line of business, each product suite essentially, into, a, into its own uh, application, into its own bounded context really, it took the data with it, and they ended up with three completely separate lines of business. So they had one application which was dealing with home insurance, one application dealing with motor, and one with life, with completely separate data. And if I was a customer, I wanted to go to this and um, buy some home insurance, I'd go to one site, and then if I wanted to renew my car insurance, I'd go to the next one. But that data was completely separate. So they had some cross-cutting capabilities as well. So they put in my account, which listened to messages when I bought insurance, a message would be generated, and they'd be aggregated here. So this is kind of like a fan-in thing. And why is that interesting from the perspective of, of how we organize? Well, this is actually enforcing, the as we sort of saw with the continental divide, this is enforcing these boundaries between these different lines of business. Right? 
We have these cross-functional teams working within each of the line of business. And that's the product owner, developers, uh, quality analysts, business analysts, and so on. So this is, seems like a nice idea, right? We've got these cross-functional teams organized around lines of business. So surely Conway is saying big thumbs up. It's all good. But if you look at this sort of um, structure, again, visualized on a chord diagram, we still have a ton of these delays, a ton of handoffs between operations, a ton of handoffs to marketing sales. Um, and finance and so on. So I honestly think that Melvin Conway is still up there and he's still sitting on the balcony laughing at us. He's going, you still haven't quite worked this out, have you? <laughs> but, but that's cool because then we can thank this dude. Yeah, yeah, Jez Humble. And Dave Farley, if he's in the room, not sure if he is. I couldn't find a Dave Farley card from the Agile card game, but I could find a Jez Humble card. DevOps. I was once told using more than one exclamation mark is the sure sign of a deranged mind. But I think this needs more than one. I don't really mean DevOps. I mean this idea of continuous delivery from soup to nuts, bringing everything together from design, um, from you know, uh, idea generation, um, you know, product gen new product gener generation, innovation, through to uh, delivering working software into production, bringing all this together into one, uh, one, um, one unit. So, you know, we have this idea of cross-functional teams. Well, we can subsume, essentially, the ops team within these. And this doesn't mean necessarily that you don't have things like platform teams and so on. You don't, you don't generalize some of the infrastructure tasks. But as I mentioned earlier with private clouds, that has to all be about self-service. Again, minimizing the cost of transactions. So, subsume these, this ops team. And, and again, we've gotten rid of one of these lines. The delays decrease. We've got less waste in our process. So, the throughput of features increases. Hooray. And that's what this uh, insurance company did. They also went cloud native, so they, they deployed into AWS and reaped a, a bunch of benefits from that. And each of these could be you know, deployed independently, could be tested independently, um, uh, could be scaled, and so on. Which kind of gets around this, this uh, awful tangled mess we sort of saw earlier um, when you have these projects. Uh, that sort of pop into a bit of code and pop out again. So the question is, can we go further, right? If you imagine all the functions a hospital has to have, uh, they all have to be involved. He didn't say all the clinical functions a hospital has to be involved. He said all the functions. You know, this is about having the porters there, having the domestic staff there, the cleaners, having finance people involved, everyone. And I think we can. I think we can actually act to reduce the waste even further by taking this line of business idea and, and, and expanding on it. I actually think the days of the IT department are numbered. I think it's, uh, I think it's a leftover from how we th thought companies should be run. Uh, the IT department should go away. The, uh, we should all work together with our business people in something that isn't IT or business. And I'm not talking about suddenly technologists taking over the world and everything becomes technology and um, technology related. I mean that in order to more, most successfully deliver value to our customers, get software out into production, we need to minimize these delays. And to do that, you need everyone in the same place. So what might that look like? Well, that means doing things like subsuming, or rather, not subsuming, combining sales, marketing, finance, continuous delivery, all these things into one sort of stable line of business. And we've been doing this specifically in Australia, actually, with great success. There's a few companies out there have been doing this. So what, um, there's one which is a, a, a property uh, website, so you know, kind of um, sells uh, sells houses essentially. So you can advertise on it. You can advertise your house. You can uh, try and buy a house and so on. And it has two different sides or several sides, but simply it has like a residential side and it has a, a commercial business. And they've separated these out into two completely different lines of business. And what marketing and sales function is needed by residential, they take into residential. So they all sit together. What marketing and sales function is needed by commercial, they're all sitting in the commercial line of business, along with the teams, along with the managing director for those lines of business, along with all that support. All, all sitting together in one place, one line of business, minimizing these delays. And it's been stupendously successful for them. So I guess where I'm going with this is this idea of having this nested structure where you have sort of teams of people who are delivering software. But they're not operating in, in a vacuum. They're um, 
operated within value streams. So I mean value stream, this is, this is a, uh, a group of people who've got a direct link, direct line to a customer, to a customer outcome. That's what a value stream really is, in my mind. And then those value streams sit within lines of business, and those lines of business sit within organizations. And in terms of microservices, each of the teams owns one or more services. One or more microservices, or yeah, one or more microservices. And I'm going to call this out because I think it's important. How many of those you build per team completely depends on your requirements. You don't have to have a million microservices. I'm just going to make that clear. And this is an example, actually. So it was a project I was on where we, were, we had like a, a user's uh, kind of customer-bounded context, and we ended up with three different services, two different databases, all within the same bounded context, within the same capability. But that was because we had requirements which led us down that route. We had very high uh, batch loads uh, expected overnight, so we wanted to front it with an event queue so we could scale competing consumers to process the queue and then scale them back during the day when we didn't have as much traffic. A specific set of requirements that we had. If we didn't have those requirements, I don't think we would have gone to the trouble of building all that. We probably just would have built a single, a single service. So you've got these teams in value streams inside lines of business with everyone together. And this is, as I say, finance, accounting, sales, marketing for those lines of business together. And do you get duplication of function? Yes, you do. You get duplication. This is not about optimizing for cost control. This is about optimizing for value generation, essentially. So in terms of um, the number of people, well, teams, sort of, you know, the normal XP size of team. But then when you scale up to the, the larger units, what does that look like? Well, I don't know if people have come across, anyone recognize immediately the random 160 to 200 number? <laughs> I wasn't expecting people to, but this is Dunbar's number. So this is the number of connections that people can socially hold at any one particular point. So you scale the teams up to the point where they reach the Dunbar's number, at which point you break things off into other units. And ThoughtWorks operates like this. We tend to split offices when we get over about 150 to 200 people. So rather than have a, a big office of 400, there are some exceptions, we'll have two separate offices scaling around Dunbar's number and multiples thereof. Now, I mentioned earlier that Conway's law is really from, you know, originally it's all about information flow. It's all about how the, the bandwidth of information between different parts of your organization. So you can imagine if you group all these people together, the bandwidth is actually much, much greater. There's some original research done around this idea of things like co-location. So this is from a book from 77, Managing the Flow of Technology. Which, uh, which is actually a really interesting read. It's about information theory. It's about actually R&D departments. This is kind of pre, uh, pre the sort of explosion um, that we're in at the moment of, of the web and the internet, pretty much. Um, so he's talking about R&D departments and engineering companies and how ideas spread between different groups of people working on different things. Did a lot of research, and I've reproduced one of the graphs here. So this is a graph of the effect of distance on communication, specifically the effect of uh, weekly conversations about work and the frequency of you having them with someone the farther you are away from them. And after about 15 meters away from someone, you're essentially completely unlikely to talk serendipitously to someone about a project you're on, a problem you might have, any of these sorts of things. Clearly, tooling has brought, has changed this, right? Clearly, we've got, uh, you know, what do the kids use these days? Is it HipChat or Slack or I don't know, whatever it is, um, IRC for the win. Um, but tool, tooling has changed this, always on video has changed this. But this, I think, is a great demonstration of the effect of co-location or of having really high bandwidth communication. You get this, you get these serendipitous conversations that occur, where ideas can spread, ideas can flow, people can share the problems that they have and the solutions that they might have. So I guess what I'm saying is that as you chunk up from team to value stream and from line of business to organization, then Conway's law is going to be acting at each of these boundaries, right? So at each of these boundaries, you're going to get this reinforcing action. Each of these boundaries, information flow becomes uh, uh, lesser, you have less bandwidth, and so at each of these boundaries you're going to get more decoupling in the software you build. So if you organize the way your software is built around these sorts of structures, Conway's law is going to be working in your favor. 
And the other cool thing is you can use different practices at these boundaries, as it turns out. So there's a lot of new practices people have been talked about. They're not even new, really, but um, things like uh, tolerant readers, consumer-driven contracts, um, you know, conversational change is a nice, nice idea. But lots of different practices that people have been adopting to try and help test, integrate microservices, to try and test them independently, to try and uh, integrate them together, and so on. But the thing is, with all these practices, they come with an increased cost in some, or in most cases. It takes effort to write consumer-driven contracts, where a consumer-driven contract is, uh, as a consumer of a service, I'm going to write in executable form my expectations of your behavior, and I'm going to hand it to you uh, so you can execute it as part of your build. Right. That, that's great. It works fantastically well, but there is effort involved. <laughs> There's effort involved in actually implementing these things. So the nice thing, I think, with this kind of structure is you get to make decisions at each level of the structure as to where it's most appropriate to invest that time and effort. So I've got this new thing I'm calling the chunking up from microservices to teams to value streams to lines of business to organizations practice onion, which I'm going to talk you through. And I might need a new name. So simply, you get to do different things at different points, uh, different um, levels of abstraction. So as you chunk up, you can do different things. As you chunk down, you do different things. So for example, between businesses, right, you're not going to want to implement, for example, consumer-driven contracts, probably. If I'm Google and I'm on the Maps API team, I'm not going to ask all the consumers of the Maps API to write a contract in executable format, send to me so I can run as part of my build. Well, I might, but I'd probably get laughed at if I did. Right. That's probably not the sort of thing you're going to be doing, because at, the at this sort of boundary, you've got this very low change rate, very high stability property. You don't want to be making many breaking changes or uh, hardly any at all. So investing in things like contract testing at this point, is, uh, at that sort of boundary, is pr probably not the right thing to do. But you might want to do semantic versioning, which is a pretty popular, um, pretty popular technique these days, practice these days. Now, semantic versioning is where each of the um, three version numbers you, you, you publish has a specific meaning. If you bump a major version, it means backwards, uh, it's backwards incompatible. Bumping minor and um, point releases means it should be backwards compatible. That's something you might want to be doing at the boundary between organizations, or also between lines of business when you do need to integrate. But between value streams within a line of business, between parts of your company that are doing similar things, similar ways, it's got a higher change rate. You want to be able to make more changes. Right? Consequently, this, it's going to be potentially less stable. So you might want to invest at this point in contract testing, in, in writing these, these contracts, these execu executable specifications of behavior. You'll also probably want to implement something like Tolerant Reader. So you can go to Martin Fowler's site. He's got the definition of tolerant reader. This is, this is essentially where, as a consumer of the service, I'm not going to directly bind or early bind to, um, to, to your, 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 uh, your wire protocol. So at this sort of level, you might want to think about semantic versioning, contract testing, and tolerant reader. And then between teams within the same value stream, <coughs> you probably don't want to bother with semantic versioning. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But you probably certainly want to do contract testing, agree this is how we work around here and implement Tolerant Reader. And then uh, within Teams, you want, want to be thinking about Tolerant Reader and this idea of conversational change. So um, Adrian Cockroft, again, he, he sort of, I think it was last year he said, that his experience at Netflix was the ratio of changes inside the team boundary to outside the team boundary was about 10 to 1. I want to be going really fast if I'm sitting next to Carol. I can just say, hey, Carol, I'm going to make that change. Is that cool with you? Can you make the same one? And we both push. And that's the sort of pace I want to be going at within my team. I don't want to be reliant on having to write contract tests and all these sorts of things. So that's pretty much the meat of what I'm talking about. So we've got these Muppets who are sitting up on the balcony laughing at us. But I think, actually, the laughter is helping us, right? Because it's pushing us in a direction which is to structure our organizations in such a way that, that we're able to more effectively produce software. Not more efficiently. So this, as I say, is not about cost control. It's not about grouping everyone with the same role together and you know, um, putting, putting sim similar things necessarily together to reduce the cost. This is about value creation. This is about effectiveness over efficiency. And I'm going to reiterate what I said at the start. 
You know, a lot of people think that microservices are all about this top thing, componentization via services. But I think all of these things are important. You know, organized around business capabilities, products over projects. We, we called that out as the thing we were seeing successful teams do for a reason rather than, um, rather than just leave them out. So finally, I think Conway's law will often send us signals in the sense of you know, um, signal to noise. You know, if you're doing things like constantly ordering work, if you're splitting stories across teams and so on, if you're moving people around, deploying in lockstep, doing fan-in for end-to-end -end testing, I suspect this, these are signals from Conway's law telling us that maybe we haven't quite got our organi uh, organizational structure quite right. Maybe there's, we're paying transaction costs. Maybe there's waste in the process that we can, that we can remove by organizing slightly differently. And also, there's definitely a high cost of work associated with, sorry, a high cost associated with work that leaves your team and goes elsewhere. So if you can organize such that the work doesn't leave your team, um, you're going to get a much higher throughput. And this is things like raising tickets with the platform team, handing off work to other departments, starting and stopping projects, and so on. I appreciate I've been quite opinionated about this. <laughs> um, but over time, this is how I've seen organizations um, structure themselves in order to, to really get stuff done the most effectively. So finally, it's a quote from Evan Botcher, my ThoughtWorks colleague, who describes what the inverse Conway maneuver says. And he said, well, what it is, he says, it's design the organization you want and the architecture will follow, kicking and screaming. Thank you very much. <laughs> now for the bun fight. <laughs> Okay. Well, I should have said, please rate this as well. You can log into the app and please do um, provide some feedback because it's incredibly useful both to me and to the organizers. So please do that. Yes, sorry. No problem. OK, um, first question. If data is kept separate in each microservice, how about the impact of keeping the data consistent? Uh, <laughs> okay, so a great question. The question was, um, if you have data in separate in for each different microservice, uh, how do you keep that data consistent? Um, was it Kent Beck who uh, said the answer to any interesting question is it depends? I think it might be. Um, and it, it does depend because, I mean, obviously if you've got data that belongs together, keep it together. Um, but in this case, the insurance example I was talking about where we had sort of in, you know, home insurance quotes in, uh, and risks policies in one place and we had pets in a completely different data store and we had life in a completely different data store. Um, we did that very deliberately because actually when we were generating domain events that were handed off to the customer account, which is the place all of these things needed to be consistent and together, the customer's view of them was completely different to the, the actual the bounded context, the business capability for, for the insurance products. So the home insurance product, for example, needs to know tons of stuff about addresses, the previous five addresses that you've had, the, um, you know, whether you live in an area that's prone to the fire risks or floods, and all these different massive, this massive long list uh, of, of, of this huge amount of data, rather. Um, but then actually the place where all of this is aggregated across the products, all it needs to know is um, what, what, the, what the price was, what the reference was, and uh, a link to go off and find more, more information. Now, um, that, that worked really well in that case. Again, I'm not suggesting that you would do that for every single solution, but um, if you can break things out in such a way that uh, you can, then it's more effective. Uh, and avoid distributed transactions, they suck. Just on the end. <laughs> One more. What do you think about Fred George's idea of programmer anarchy and self-organizing around products and tasks? Uh, so um, I actually missed Fred's talk a minute ago. I'm not sure if he's in the room. Um, I hope not. No. Uh, um, so, the, so the question is, uh, how do I feel about this idea of programmer anarchy? So this is, and this is genuinely working for a lot of companies now. This idea that you could completely self-organise. You go and work where you want. You literally take your desk and move it to where you want to work. So I know Valve. Are very keen on this, the um, games company. I believe Facebook operate pretty much in the same way. I think Eric was talking about that yesterday. Um, how do I feel about that? I think that's a fantastic idea uh, if you can get it to work. But I think it needs incredibly courageous leadership. I think it needs incredibly smart, um, disciplined uh, people executing it. Um, and it doesn't always work either. So um, I've seen cases where, you know, it's like, oh, we don't write tests anymore because we're all programmer anarchy, woo. And then you actually ask the developers, and they're like, yeah, it didn't work out so, much, so, so well for us. We've started writing tests again now. Yeah, But you know, 
It's no one size fits all. Okay, one last one. Uh, co-location is a pre prerequisite. That's a, a long word. What about the offshoring model? Uh, does it uh, mean that uh, we shouldn't do that at all? Um, so the question is, uh, co-location is, uh, is 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 a good idea if you can if you can do it. Um, does that it mean that we shouldn't offshore uh, work? There are many reasons for offshoring other than. Um, well, the main reason is cost, right? The main reason you offshore work is because it's going to be cheaper to get someone on a, in a different location to pay uh, to, to, to do the work. Um, in some cases, we've seen it work really, really well. Actually, in ThoughtWorks, we tend to do these things like splits. If we're going to offshore, we have offshore teams in India, in China, in uh, Brazil. If we can offshore, we'll try and split the, the applications in such a way that it's going to reinforce the system boundary. So this team over here will take retail, for example. This team over here will take fulfillment. And they might be on different continents. And that's, that's, that kind of works quite well. In fact, that's what happened in the first story I sort of told, because um, was, there was an offshore team and an onshore team. Um, is it ideal? Uh, probably not. Probably not, um, unless you organize in that particular way. We, we have this constant struggle in work, actually, because you know, we're a consultancy. We believe agile. Eric Meyer's not in, I hope. <laughs> um, so we, work, we, we use XP to, to, to run our projects normally. Um, and so we've always thought, you know, on-site customer being as close to the customer as possible is, um, is important. And so we, we try our hardest to work on-site whenever we can. But the problem is, problem of course, and maybe this is getting... I do ramble in these answers, apologies. But maybe the... Um, uh, I, think, I think these days the pressure is so great on hiring people, on retaining people, that we're actually going to have to start thinking about new ways of working. Fortunately, the tools that we've got, always on video, um, always on chat, all these different things, actually sort of start to make a difference with that. But I, I personally still think that co-location, co um, for the serendipity of the, of the conversations and so on, is, is best. That's a long involve. It, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.